Well, thank you all very much for the opportunity to come here and talk to you today. I'm really uh, delighted to have this chance. I've been uh, doing some talking about uh, arms control in the information age over the last several uh, months, really starting at Stanford University last October, where I delivered a talk on uh, arms control in the information age, also at Yale University and uh, University of Washington in the United States. And then about a month ago, I was in uh, Lithuania in Vilnius and talked to uh, students there and this last Friday in uh, Moscow at the uh, Moscow State Institute for International Relations. So I've been trying to, uh, to really get the message out that, first of all, there are many interesting, I think, new directions that we should be considering for arms control policy. I'm the, the person who was uh, from the U.S. side in charge of negotiating the New START Treaty, New Strategic Arms Reduction Treaty with the Russian Federation. So it was uh, that experience of negotiating New START that really got me thinking about what some of the new applications may be for information technologies and the products of the information revolution. So I'd like to talk to you today about some of the ideas that, uh, that I've come up with uh, and have been thinking about and talk a little bit about the effect of the information revolution overall on 21st century diplomacy, on how it's made some changes in how we think about uh, diplomacy but also uh, talk about how uh, some new information technologies may be able to help us in the work that we do um, on arms control monitoring and verification. Uh, I wanted to start out by noting two things. First of all, last Tuesday, uh, Foreign Minister Pyatt was in Washington to meet with my boss, uh, Secretary of State Hillary Clinton, and uh, they have agreed to enhance joint work on cybersecurity. So I hope that will present a lot more opportunities for, uh, for us to be working with Estonia on areas of, uh, of cyber policy and cyber technology overall. I think that's really a great, uh, a great step forward. And we know that uh, in uh, this month, late in the month, we'll have President Ilves visit to Washington. So I think that will represent also some great opportunities for the United States and Estonia to strengthen our cooperation and be working together on uh, information technologies and, and the way forward overall. Another thing I wanted to note is that uh, it was March 27th, 2012, that was the 20th anniversary of the first ever Estonian uh, internet-based connection. It was made when scientific institutes in Estonia and Sweden exchanged an electronic letter only 20 years ago last week. And it took, in the blistering fast period of time, it took a whole hour to get that letter transferred back and forth. So it's amazing what has happened in the last 20 years. Truly, truly amazing. The United States just passed a milestone of our own. This past February, uh, we celebrated the one-year anniversary of the New START Treaty's entry into force. And I'm happy to report that implementation of that treaty is going, is going very, very well. But New START was just the beginning. President Obama made it clear in his now famous speech in Prague that the United States is committed to uh, pursuing a world without nuclear weapons. He reiterated his vision last week in Seoul. In his remarks at the Nuclear Security Summit in Seoul, South Korea, President Obama said that, I knew that this goal would not be reached quickly, perhaps not in my lifetime, but I know we have to begin and with some concrete steps. So in order to pursue that long-term goal of a world without nuclear weapons, we're going to have to think bigger and bolder. With this in mind, I've been challenging myself, and I said already some students around the United States and now on the international scene as well, to think about how we use the knowledge of our past together with the tools of the information age. I know you all don't have any problem thinking about the applications of new technologies, but I'm still figuring out how to use my iPad, so it's a little more difficult for me. But I do think that it makes sense to think about the applicability of uh, these uh, methods and technologies to a lot 
of the international foreign policy goals that we have. My own responsibility happens to be in the area of arms control, so that's what I'm talking to you about today. But I think there are many, many opportunities for using these kinds of technologies on a broader diplomatic stage. So first, I'm going to say a few things about the changing nature of diplomacy, and then second, turn to how I think these new technologies might help us on the road to zero. Diplomacy today is very, very different from it was the way it was before the information age. For one thing, we are now negotiating treaties a lot more quickly. And as a result, diplomats like, like me have to learn to respond to new circumstances. Uh, before even my own eyes, diplom diplomacy has been changing uh, incredibly. I was a junior member of the U.S. START delegation in 1990 and 1991, an experience that served me very well when I was negotiating the new START treaty. I remember how things were done back then. Masses of paper had to be shuttled among members of the delegation, and we were constantly burning up Xerox machines. If we needed to communicate with Washington, we sent a fax back to Washington. Remember faxes? They've disappeared like the dinosaur. They really aren't around very much anymore. But that was only the period of 1990 and 1991. When the new START negotiations began in April of 2009, the world had changed dramatically. The U.S. and Russian delegations launched into the negotiations committed to keeping them respectful and businesslike, even if we didn't always agree. And we agreed to disagree in private. That was good considering how easily either delegation could have broadcast negative comments before either of us was able to pick up the phone to Moscow or Washington and warn the folks back home. For me, the biggest change in how we did business was email. Instead of making hard copies and waiting days or weeks uh, for the word to, to get back to us, sometimes via snail mail, we could get information around the delegation and to our leaders in Washington within uh, a few uh, short minutes or hours. Both classified and unclassified materials could be sent, decreasing necessary trips back to Washington as well. After some discussion, we also agreed to exchange negotiating documents with the Russian team electronically, although on uh, disks and not via email. Still, even CDs made a big difference to after-hours communication. There was a famous story during the negotiation of the START Treaty back in 1990 about how one night the U.S. negotiating team had to, develop, had to deliver some documents to the Soviet, then Soviet mission in Geneva. And when they got to the mission, it was after midnight and nobody was at the gate. And the guy on the Soviet side was standing over. They could see him, but they couldn't get anybody to open the gate. The guards had gone home. It was after midnight. So the American ended up hurling the satchel with the negotiating documents over the fence and his, his colleague on the other side caught it and took it away. So you see even in this case uh, exchanging CDs rather than email communication, nevertheless it made it easier to hand documents over in the dead of night, which we did from time to time during negotiation of the new START Treaty. When you're working on a negotiation of that kind, especially in the end game, it gets to be really, really uh, intensive and you're working practically all night long and sometimes you have to get documents to your Russian counterpart even in the middle of the night. So it frankly would have been easier if we could have used email, but no, we had to physically exchange documents still at this phase in our uh, diplomatic cooperation. At some point maybe we'll be able to email them securely and vice versa. In my view, these new approaches to the formal negotiating process uh, were a big factor in the speed at which these negotiations took place. They were one year from start to finish, and compare that to how long it took to negotiate the START Treaty back in the 80s and 90s. That was about a six-year process. So I think these electronic uh, capabilities and tools really made a big uh, difference even to the physical time period for negotiating this particular treaty. Soon, I hope uh, I'll be able to go across the hall uh, from my office and uh, talk to counterparts in different countries around the world using video connections. Believe it or not, it's not really common inside the government to do that yet, but I hope to be able to do that. You need secure communications, obviously. You need 
the ability to link up with a bunch of different foreign ministries. That doesn't happen all that easily. But uh, already I'm using all kinds of different modes of communication, including things like text messages to get in touch with my counterparts. So that's, you know, it may seem like nothing to you, but for uh, official diplomats, it's a big step and a big change in how we do business. Now let me turn to new technologies and arms control. Today, um, we have a special job, I think, as I mentioned at the outset, the president has called for trying to move toward lower and lower numbers of nuclear weapons and it's going to require some intense efforts to uh, improve and intensify how we monitor and verify arms control treaties. T today we verify that countries are fulfilling their arms control treaty obligations through a combination of information exchange, notifications of weapon status, on-site inspections, and national means, uh, also called national technical means. NTM are big assets such as observation satellites, phased array radars that individual countries manage and control. It's long been a rule of arms control treaties that we don't interfere with, with each other's national technical means. We allow each other's, these eyes and ears, to monitor treaties. All of the elements that I've listed work together to form an effective verification regime. So we're looking for ways to expand the modes of verification that we have available to us. So I've been asking myself, can we incorporate open source information technologies and social networking methods into arms control verification and monitoring? New concepts I recognize are not invented overnight and we don't understand the full range of possibilities that are inherent in the information age. But we would be remiss if we didn't start thinking right now whether new technologies can augment over half a century of arms control negotiating expertise. Our new reality is a smaller, increasingly networked world where the average citizen connects to other citizens in cyberspace hundreds of times each day. They exchange and share ideas on a wide variety of topics. So why not put this vast problem-solving entity to good use? Today, any event anywhere on the planet could be broadcast globally in seconds. That means it is harder to hide things. When it is harder to hide things, it's easier to get caught. The neighborhood gaze is a powerful tool. And it can help us to make sure that countries are following the rules of arms control treaties and agreements. Open source information technologies improve arms control verification in at least two ways, either as a way of generating new information or as analysis of information that's already out there. The Defense Advanced Research Projects Agency, DARPA, for example, uh, rolled out in 2009 the so-called Red Balloon Project, the Red Balloon Challenge. In recognition of the 40th anniversary of the Internet, DARPA held this competition where 10 red weather balloons were moored at visible fixed locations around the continental United States. The first team to identify the location of all 10 balloons won a sizable cash prize, $40,000. Over 4,300 teams composed of an estimated 2 million people from 25 countries took part in the challenge. A team from the Massachusetts Institute of Technology won the challenge, identifying all of the balloon locations in an astonishing time of 8 hours and 52 minutes. I know it's astonishing because I went out to DARPA to talk about the Red Balloon Challenge and they expected it would take at least 48 hours, at least a full two days, to find all the balloons. So they were astonished when it took uh, less than nine hours to find them all. Of course, to win in such a short time or complete the challenge at all, MIT did not find the balloons themselves. They tapped into social networks with a unique incentive structure that not only incentivized people to identify the balloon locations, but also incentivized people to recruit others to the team. Their win showed the enormous potential of social networking and also demonstrated how incentives can motivate large, uh, large populations to work toward a common goal. Now, how could something like this work in an arms control context? Let's just imagine that a country facing a deep nuclear reduction regime, signing up to a treaty where it was required to really go to very low numbers of nuclear weapons, wanted to establish its bona fides in that kind of deep nuclear reduction environment. 
It may, in that case, wish to open itself up to a verification challenge. It could prove, seek to prove, for example, that it wasn't stashing extra nuclear missiles in the woods or a fissile material production reactor in the desert. Of course, some form of international supervision would likely be required to ensure the legitimacy of the challenge and its procedures. And we would have to consider whether such a challenge could cope with the especially difficult problems of a covert environment, such as caves or deep underground facilities. A, te techni a technique like this, I call it a public verification challenge, might be especially valuable as we move to lower numbers of nuclear weapons. Governments would have an interest in proving that they are meeting their uh, arms control obligations and may want to engage their publics in making the case. It would be necessary to work together to make sure nations cannot spoof or manipulate a verification challenge of this type. We also have to bear in mind that there could be limitations based on the freedom of information available to the citizens of any country trying this type of approach. These are both big problems and problems that will require uh, hard work to tackle. In addition to developing new information, harvesting and analyzing existing information can be helpful too. There are lots of people working on analyzing Twitter streams. One of them who's come to my attention is Leila Shakir uh, Shereen Sakur, who is a University of Southern California doctoral candidate. She's designed a computer program to aggregate Twitter data and patterns that enabled her to understand the events of the Arab Spring and Libya's revolution as they were unfolding. The ability to identify patterns and trends in social networks could aid the arms control verification process. In the most basic sense, social media can draw attention to both routine and abnormal events. We may be able to uh, use data mining to understand where strange effluents are flowing, for example, to recognize patterns of industrial activities, and to cue sensors and satellites. Such cueing could help us to make better use of our scarce and expensive national technical means, or in some cases to supplement them in important ways. This is a major issue in an age of budget austerity where the price tag for big hardware like satellites is becoming more and more difficult to meet. We need such big hardware, but it's becoming harder to pay for it. In the same vein, we should think about what there is to gain from using open source geospatial databases such as Google Earth. Of course, NGOs, students, and private citizens have been using open source uh, satellite images for research for some time now. Now even one of the most famous men in the world is applying these new technological tools to human rights promotion in uh, Sudan and South Sudan. I'm talking about actor George Clooney, who in conjunction with NGOs, academic institutions, and businesses created the so-called Satellite Sentinel Project, or SSP. SSP uses commercial satellite imagery to systematically monitor and report on possible threats to human security in real time. Digital globe satellites passing over Sudan and South Sudan cap capture imagery of potential threats to civilizations. The satellites can pick up types and varieties of helicopters, tanks, and multiple rocket launch systems, among, among many, many other items of concern. The Harvard University Humanitarian Initiative analyzes imagery and information from sources on the ground to produce the reports. The Enough Project then releases the reports to the press and to policymakers and sounds the alarm by notifying the news media and civic groups. This synergy, I think, is stunning. Bringing together private citizens, yes, bringing together you know, famous actors like George Clooney, but groups conducting their own monitoring project to analyze the information and then publicize it and bring out the results via traditional news media as well as social media networks. Beyond movie stars, the information age is creating a greater talent pool of individuals to aid in technology development. People can reach a broader, diverse market for their products and services. Private citizens can develop web-based applications for e-book readers, cell phones, and touchpad communication devices. This crowdsourcing lets everyday people solve problems by getting innovative ideas out of their heads and uh, onto shelves to be sold. Open source technology could be useful in the hands of arms control inspectors, 
Smartphone and tablet applications could be created for the express purpose of aiding in the verification and monitoring process. For example, by having all safeguards and verification sensors in an inspected facility wirelessly connected to the inspector's iPad, he or she could note anomalies and flag specific items for closer inspection, as well as compare readings in real time and interpret them in context. Some of this is already happening. Some of our uh, work that we're doing with the Russian Federation at the present time, for example, on uh, uh, downblending of highly enriched uranium, uh, we are using some of these kinds of applications in the process of monitoring the downblending process in, in Russia. So it's already happening on the ground with inspectors who are associated with, with an ongoing project at the present time. As we think about new ways to use these tools, we should be aware that there could be trouble ahead. We cannot assume that information will always be so readily available. As nations and private entities continue to debate the line between privacy and security, it is possible to imagine that we are living in a golden age of open source information that will be harder to take advantage of in the future. In the end, the goal of using open source information technology and social networks should be able to add to our existing arms control monitoring and verification capabilities, but not replace what is out there and what we do using traditional methods and also traditional technologies such as national technical means satellite technologies. As I like to stress when I talk about these ideas, the speech is not about finished U.S. policy. There, there aren't kind of uh, agreements among our government agencies that this is the way we should go. But I'm out there, I'm appealing to audiences like this one where you've been doing a lot of thinking about the applications of information technology so that people start to think big uh, about the future. I really think if we're ever going to move towards zero nuclear weapons, we're really going to have to get into some approaches that will allow us to be much more certain that uh, nuclear warheads, nuclear weapon systems are truly being uh, eliminated and destroyed. So it's going to be important to come up with a lot of innovative new ideas about how to go about them. Some of them will be along traditional trajectories of technology development, such as the establishment of information barrier technologies that will allow us to, for example, go and look at weapon storage sites without giving up sensitive information about the development and the capacity and capability of existing warheads that are held in those facilities. So some of the trajectories of technology development are more or less in the traditional vein of arms control monitoring and verification. But others, I think, must really get out into this world of information technology and allow us to really engage the public and engage uh, the entire society in the effort that will, it will take to get us to where we can be confident in the unambiguous uh, implementation of a zero nuclear weapons type of agreement or arrangement. As I said, this is a speech that's about ideas to try to get us all thinking in some new directions. It's not about finished policy. In Seoul, President Obama said, your generation, I see in your generation the spirit we need in this endeavor, an optimism that beats in the hearts of so many young people around the world. It's that refusal to accept the world as it is, the imagination to see the world as it ought to be, and the courage to turn that vision into reality. As governments around the world work to enhance and expand our arms control and nonproliferation efforts, we are going to need your help to figure out new ways to go about it, to figure out new ways to get the world steadily closer to that goal of zero nuclear weapons. So thank you very much for the opportunity to speak to you today. I'll be happy to answer your questions on these or other topics. I'd be happy to hear what kind of research you have afoot here at the college that uh, may have its applications to uh, the kinds of problems that I've laid out today. I will say I'm very impressed. Uh, I was in uh, Tallinn only today, but I've had some briefings today on the, uh, the applications in Est Estonia of, uh, of uh, the whole uh, approach to having an e-society, to having uh, databases that are, are well linked together and that allow you to do so much of the day-in, day-out interaction with the government basically over the internet 
as well as the banking system and, and so forth. This is something that does not exist in the United States, and I know you all understand that you're on the cutting edge uh, of a lot of these uh, developments in the information revolution. So to me, it's a real opportunity to talk to you today, and uh, I thank you for the opportunity. Be happy to answer your questions and, uh, and take uh, your comments. Thank you very much. So any questions, comments? Please. What are your thoughts on the Coney 2012 uh, project? Or, uh, do you know about it? I don't. Tell me about it. Um, it is kind of like social social media campaign to arise awareness about this uh, bad guy called Coney. Oh yes, <laughs> I have heard about this. Yeah, and then, but if it's, uh, uh, do you think it's uh, poli how much is politics involved in it? And uh, I heard also conspiracy theories that it's a way of uh, uh, promoting war against uh, Uganda. Hmm. Well, I don't know enough about it to be able to to comment uh, to that uh, to that depth. I will say I've read about it. You see, I've read about it um, basically in the print newspapers and so forth, so I understand that it's something that has been uh, underway recently, but, uh, and it's an attempt to use social, social media and information flowing in that way to, uh, to find this guy, but I actually don't know uh, exactly how it's unfolding, so very interesting what you have to say. One more question. Do you have a Facebook account? I do, as a matter of fact. Great. <laughs> I do, as a matter of fact. I also tweet. So, but I have to say my tweets are pretty boring because uh, I use them. Well, it's a combination. I do put out some of my, um, my book and music favorites on my Twitter account. But a, a lot of times what I use Twitter for is to put out, for example, uh, if we have a new fact sheet about the Comprehensive Test Ban Treaty, I'll put it out on Twitter so that I have a lot of followers in the United States who are in the uh, world of arms control policy or in the world of, uh, of uh, defense and uh, security, security media. So they use it as a kind of way to get information about, about what to write on uh, in, their own, uh, in their own press. So I don't use it in quite the flexible way that it can be used. But I've been actually having a fair amount of fun with it. So, so follow me on Twitter. <laughs> Yes, please. Yeah, I have two questions. Uh, um, my question pertains to our uh, cyber uh, domain. Um, to what extent uh, are I having discussions inside the establishment in Washington about the uh, uh, cyber weapons control, uh, which is becoming a problem? I, well, the United States themselves probably are at the forefront of developing cyber mm -hmm. weapons. Um, and the second question, um, the conventional uh, arms control regime in Europe has effectively collapsed. Have you been thinking uh, how uh, harnessing IT technology uh, and achievements and uh, what you've just spoken, uh, social media and so on, could at least somehow compensate for the lack now of, of transparency that, that we will have uh, concerning conventional uh, arms control in, in Europe? Okay, two very good questions. Uh, first of all, on the, um, the area, I don't really believe in cyber arms control because arms control uh, has been related to limiting physical objects historically, and the whole cyber arena is so much, so much different. Um, I do think that there are two areas that we can profitably look to the past as we consider now how to manage, manage this particular area of policy. The first is by uh, looking to uh, norms and principles that have been well established in uh, the world of, uh, of uh, you know, not only uh, the arms control policy world, but also in the world of international law, the law of armed conflict, for example, how and in what ways does it apply to the cyber world? So we need to be thinking about, uh, about norms. We need to be thinking about principles. That's one way uh, I think we can draw from the past to try to manage this important new very important new uh, area of policy. But the second, uh, I think we can look to the, to the past for confidence building, 
measures that have been used historically. For example, now recently um, the Russian Federation has expressed its interest in, in, in joining bilaterally with the United States on cyber confidence building measures. And confidence building measures are over a very wide range. They can range from a simple information exchange. So with the Russians, we've exchanged white papers, for example, on cyber policy. Very simple, very simple measure. They can then range up through exchanging regular notifications when there are, uh, there are developments of interest, so notifications if there are cyber incidents. And there are several now ways we are exchanging information with the Russians on cyber incidents, including through the so-called Nuclear Risk Reduction Center. The Nuclear Risk Reduction Center is how we exchange notifications in the New START Treaty. Every time we move one of our missiles, we tell the Russians. Every time we move one of our bombers out of the continental United States for more than 24 hours, we tell the Russians. Same with the Russians. Every time they move a missile to the maintenance base, or every time they move one of their bombers out of Russia, for more than 24 hours, they have to notify us. That all, all that notification information flows through the Nuclear Risk Reduction Center. And so now certain uh, cyber incidents will also be, will be passing some notifications through the Nuclear Risk Reduction Center. So that's a very small example of how one can use some of the mechanisms that were developed for traditional, quote unquote, traditional arms control in the cyber arena, but I frankly think that those examples are rather few and far between. And how we develop uh, cooperation to try to manage uh, and ensure that the cyber environment is available for, uh, for use and ensure that it's uh, available for the international uh, community overall, that we have available the kind of communication mechanisms we have today, uh, that's going to be a different kind of problem from the problem of controlling and eliminating nuclear conventional arms. Now let me turn to the conventional arms uh, regime in Europe. It hasn't collapsed, actually. We ceased implementing uh, the Conventional Forces in Europe Treaty vis-a-vis -vis the Russians last November as a countermeasure to what they did in December 2007, which is they suspended their implementation of the CFE Treaty. They refused to allow us to come and inspect their territory. They refused to provide us information. And we, uh, inside the NATO alliance and with some other partners, including Georgia and Moldova, decided that it was high time that we impose a countermeasure on the Russian Federation. So we ceased implementing the CFE treaty vis-a-vis -vis Russia, but we are continuing to implement it at 29. People say, well, isn't that pretty worthless, uh, a conventional arms control treaty without the Russians? It's not, because there are other regional security problems in Europe, particularly in the Caucasus. It's proven especially valuable in continuing to regulate the uh, relationship between Azerbaijan and Armenia, for example. So we believe that the structure is still there, and we've told the Russians they can return at any time. As you can imagine, since they suspended implementation in 2007, they're not too keen. But it is, I think, uh, meant to convey very clearly to them that they can't just uh, you know, pull a plug and continue to reap the benefits. Because in all this time, from 2007 to November 2011, we were providing them data every year. We were continuing to comply with the obligations of the CFE Treaty. So they have now basically uh, had to take had to take some hits for their behavior back in December of 2007. Now, what are we doing going forward? Uh, we are looking to the future. There are actually three pillars of conventional arms control in Europe. One is the Vienna document confidence building regime, and the second is the Open Skies Treaty. The third is the conventional forces in Europe Treaty, which we're now looking to modernize and thinking about where we want to go from here on conventional arms control in Europe. But those other two pillars, the Vienna document and the Open Skies Treaty, continue uh, to be very important, uh, I would say, pillars of conventional arms control in Europe. Uh, now, as to your idea of using some of these tools of the information revolution, I certainly hope so. I was just talking to some Estonian colleagues about the notion of having a uh, more easily validated database if, as you do here in Estonia, you can actually just dock in to a database with properly validated uh, identification 
it would be in many ways easier to maintain a validated database rather than the very, and this is just an idea, again, I'm not saying that the United States is embracing this as a matter of policy right today, but it occurred to me it would be extremely valuable to have that kind of system. It would cut down on what is today a very, very burdensome paper process um, of you know exchanging data. It's paper plus some electronic stuff, but in many cases we're ex still exchanging disks of data, so you know it would be much much easier to have a similar kind of approach to what you have developed here in Estonia. So I very much welcome that idea, and it's certainly something we'll look into. So if you've got other ideas, let me know. Other questions? Yes, please. Can you please comment on the very idea which uh, our honourable neighbour and uh, its our honourable neighbour neighbour discuss that the information technology itself becoming a weapon. I don't know what that means. Do you Russia, have any idea what they meant by Russia that? Russia and China. Yeah. They are trying to, to show it like the information technology itself is a weapon and should be limited and controlled and, and whatever else. Oh, yes. Well, this is their, obviously, their approach, and it's one that we very much disagree with in the international uh, community uh, where there are efforts afoot to develop, uh, you know, some kinds of norms and principles. As I mentioned, the Russians have been arguing that, and the Chinese have been arguing that, in fact, there have to be constraints placed on the Internet. There have to be uh, limits and... Uh, and uh, various controls, and we simply do not agree with that. It's a difference of, of view. The Russians and the Chinese aren't the only ones. There are others who are trying to put in place now a, uh, a code of conduct for the information arena that would place constraints on, on Internet usage, for example, and, and we simply do not agree with that. So there are some major philosophical differences that are going to have, going to, have to be tackled. But I'll tell you, I was quite interested in the reaction I got to this speech uh, in Moscow because at least the younger people I was talking to were quite interested. And they were quite interested, I'll just mention the point that they f raised with me was validation of information. They said, our government is never going to trust data, even as I was saying, let's, let's talk about the accumulation of of millions of, of pieces of uh, basically weak evidence and how one could apply that then to, to making some conclusions about uh, you know, whether or not, uh, again, a country's hiding some missiles out in the woods somewhere. They said, no, our government is never going to accept that kind of accumulation of weak evidence. They'll want only validated information, so you're going to have to develop a system of validation. So it was an interesting perspective for me to hear how immediately they were reacting to these kinds of ideas. The notion that there could be a public-private partnership with more or less uh, a trusted, although not completely trusted, but more or less a trusted relationship between public and private actors was, um, was something of a new idea uh, for, for them in this, in this discussion. Early days, early, early discussion. But, one of the things that I discussed in Moscow, and I'm act actually very interested in trying to engineer, is the notion of a, a kind of, um, perhaps a kind of contest to come up with some ideas that would develop uh, in the directions that I laid out in these remarks today. So we might, uh, we might try to do that. I think it would be very interesting to see what different kinds of ideas uh, flowed from, uh, from different, uh, different countries. Yes? Thank you very much for your clear and, uh, and straightforward statements on those issues. Uh, yeah. Pretty much a year ago, Keith Alexander, the United States head of Cyber Command, yes. visited Estonia, yes. and he picked up similar weather. This it, kind? It was even worse. Uh -huh. Uh -huh. Uh, congratulations on that selection. Uh, so you also feel uh, what true spring feels in Estonia. Yes. <laughs> but I would like to follow up what he started a year ago. He made very clear statement uh, underlying the fact that uh, the probability of nuclear conflict from his perspective is... Uh, zero or less? It's uh, closing <laughs> to zero. He is an educated person and knows yes. that probability can't go below the zero. <laughs> uh, and he in the same time <coughs> emphasized <laughs> the fact that the probability of cyber conflict is uh, raising 
very sharply. Uh, the approach towards, which we also very much share in Estonia in our cyber strategy, to focus on norms, principles, and also on uh, selective confidence building measures uh, is, uh, is exactly the same as uh, um, United States has and the vast majority of European countries. Yes. However, one issue which we have recognized, well, we might say that we are also getting close now to the uh, fifth anniversary of Cyber Boy with the story, kind of the renowned uh, media event. Mm -hmm. uh, but uh, throughout the last five years, we recognized the increase of uh, awareness on the heads of governments. However, the conclusion still is that it's not enough to build a coalition of same-minded countries for the norms and principles-based uh, cyber arms or cyber conflict prevention. How can we, based on what we have been talking, training, teaching, senior civil servants from different governments, uh, governments uh, also speaking in different conferences, how can we escalate the one thing which is a precondition for starting international dialogue about cybersecurity, which is awareness. Awareness building, and it's not enough to deal with the Russian or Chinese awareness building. They are extremely aware of what they express and how they practice what they express. Mm -hmm. We are talking about the rest 190 plus countries around the world, which among the security strategies don't rank cybersecurity in top 10 of the security threats. This is something we need, and which we propose from Estonia to build a coalition for awareness building on cybersecurity issues on a global arena. I think that is, uh, that is extremely important and I welcome the priority that uh, Estonia has placed on this matter of building awareness. I will tell you quite honestly that we are facing a generational challenge here. I mean, I mentioned at the outset that I'm still trying to figure out how to use my iPad. So, you know, and I consider myself to be fairly savvy, but it's not, and I have a Twitter account, so, you know, wow. But there are uh, many, many senior government officials around the world who have barely an idea how to use an email account. So that's the problem that you're facing, I think, uh, many times in building awareness. So my view is here that it is actually uh, the uh, younger generations coming up that are much more savvy in using these technologies that can begin as they uh, develop uh, more and more, uh, how shall I put it, interesting activities that come to the attention of, of uh, leaders up the chain, that that's going to be the way that uh, cyber awareness is built. And it can be, I don't want to imply in any way negative activity, but also I would urge, you know, that there could be a lot of, uh, a lot of attention given to how, um, how these, uh, these cyber technologies and information technologies are being used in a positive way and you know getting that word out and getting the, the word spread around I think can really begin to to raise awareness uh, in in governments uh, overall but at the present time I do think in places like the United States in places uh, like Estonia in places like Russia and China where you know the game is afoot already uh, th there's a lot of recognition and general alexander is very articulate on this score i've talked with him about it myself so people really understand what the importance is but still it's a matter of organizing work against uh, the backdrop of the vast number of issues that are affected by this issue and and people ask you know is it is it an it issue is it uh is it a police matter? Are we talking about fighting crime? Is this a matter for the de Defense Department, the Ministries of Defense? You know, there are just so many, or is it, is it a, um, an ITU kind of issue? Are we talking about uh, international communications and how you uh, ensure international communications are sustained? So there's this vast array of actors then bureaucratically and all the uh, governments around the world that somehow have to be brought into the into the circle for discussion so these are significant challenges but i think the degree to which 
the you know the interest and the impetus is bubbling up from uh, the younger generations, I think it can be very helpful. And Estonia's definitely got a role to play in that regard. Other questions, comments? Yes, please. You call it perfectly the light side of information technology. Uh, and my question is on the dark side. Mm -hmm. If you look at uh, mm -hmm. things like Stuxnet or, or several blackout cases in the US power stations or, or some other more complicated cyber attacks, <coughs> or the same good technology using social networks and <coughs> things like that, that they could be used for good, they could be used for bad. Do you have any activities going on in the States uh, looking for the dark side, how to defend from Absolutely. the dark side? Yes, quite a bit. In fact, one of the vast areas that uh, General Alexander is working on with the Cyber Command is defense. And that's uh, an area where there are um, you know, just many resources being, being devoted. Also on the technological side, I'm uh, very aware um, of a number of examples having been, you know, I'm, part of my career has been spent in the Department of Energy, so I'm very aware of work that is going on even in our U.S. national laboratories. Um, but uh, some very impressive work going on at the Idaho National Laboratory, for example, on defensive, uh, defensive technologies for protecting uh, protecting electricity grids, that, that type of thing. So there is an enormous amount of work going on. I did choose in this speech, you pointed to it quite rightly, to focus on what the more positive applications could be in a policy realm that you know we might not otherwise have considered. I'll tell you why I came to this. It has to do with a frustration that I faced when I was working uh, on negotiating the New START Treaty. I would um, ask my delegation, as we were thinking through what should the verification regime of the New START Treaty look like, I would ask my delegation, well, can't we use some of these new open source technologies that are available? And uh, the, some of the older guys on my delegation would say, oh, no, 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 no. We must depend on our own national technical means. We must depend on our sal satellites, on our, uh, on our big radar systems. We must depend on what the inspectors can see with their eyes and hear with their ears and draw with their pencils on a pad of paper because that's all they were allowed to take traditionally into an inspected facility. That's what we need to depend on. So then I would turn, I had several inspectors on my team as well and they were very experienced. So I would turn to the inspectors and I would say, well, tell me, do you use Google Earth? And they'd say, of course we use Google Earth. Before we go on an inspection, we open up our laptops, we look at the Russian missile facility that we're going to go inspect, we see if, you know, if there's been a recent snowfall, we see you know, what's been happening in terms of the road network around. They, they said, of course we'd look at the site on Google Earth before we go, but then they have to close their laptops and leave them there and when they actually go in to conduct the inspection, they're allowed to take a pad of paper and a pencil and a measuring tape. And that's all they're allowed to take with them. So it just, it made me start to think, well, what can we, what can we do to make this more regularized? How we make use of new open source and electronic capabilities that are, are available to us. And I think for that reason, um, it's also worthwhile looking at applications that we may not otherwise have thought of for, for the information revolution overall. But you're quite right. The dark side is the one I think that preoccupies, preoccupies our decision makers the vast amount of the time, quite honestly. And certainly General Alexander's whole organization is very much focused on, on the cyber defense part of, part of the equation. So it's, uh, it's extraordinarily Extraordinarily important and of course has been very much a part of Estonia's DNA since you uh, experienced the 
the uh, crisis in 2007. So very important part of, of your work as well, I know. Further questions? Uh, yes, please. Short question. Uh, start agreement was, of course, a great step forward in limiting strategic weapons, nuclear weapons. What about the tactical nuclear weapons in Europe? Yes, well, when uh, the day President Obama signed the New START Treaty in April of 2010, he said that he wants to proceed on with further reductions in uh, nuclear weapons, and he named three categories for further reductions. Further reductions in deployed nuclear weapons, those are weapons that are loaded on their delivery vehicles, on their missiles, submarine, land-based missiles. And so... Um, there will be further reductions in his proposal in those types of systems, but also reductions for the first time in non-strategic or sometimes called tactical nuclear weapons and reductions in non-deployed nuclear weapons, weapons that are held in storage facilities in reserve, not loaded on top of their missiles. So those latter two categories are brand new. We've never tried, always historically, again, it's been attached to the reliability of monitoring and verification. You can see a big missile from outer space. You can see a bomber from outer space. You can count it even from a satellite in outer space. So it was the limitations of the verification technology available to us that really led us in the direction of controlling and constraining big systems, warheads loaded on their delivery vehicles. So now, in the future, we are looking to tactical nuclear weapon reductions, non-strategic nuclear weapons, and also non-deployed nuclear weapons, and we will be uh, pursuing those negotiations. I have to tell you, um, at the present time, we're in a bit of a homework period because uh, we have going on the deterrence and defense posture review in NATO that is looking at the future of uh, tactical nuclear weapons here in Europe and what uh, the relationship should be among uh, so-called TAC nukes, non-strategic nuclear weapons, missile defenses, and conventional nuclear weapons uh, in the Euro uh, European NATO de deterrence and defense strategy. So that review will be finished at the time of the Chicago summit coming up in May, and by then we should be ma uh, ready to make some proposals to the Russian Federation about exactly how to proceed. But first we have to decide inside NATO exactly how we're going to proceed on this and then uh, then we'll be able to m move forward with the Russians. I have to tell you quite honestly they haven't been uh, too enthusiastic. They've been piling up you know factors they say that have to be taken into account before they'll be willing to proceed with further reductions including US missile defense developments and the European phased adaptive approach with our NATO allies and uh, other things like the fate of conventional arms control in Europe. So they have a lot of issues they say have to be confronted. We'll see. I think they too have an interest in further nuclear reductions. We'll just have to, to see how the politics unfolds uh, really after the Chicago summit and as 2012 rolls forward with, uh, with our election campaign coming up uh, and election in, in November. So. Listen, thank you all very much. It's been great to be here today. I appreciate the opportunity to speak to you, and uh, thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you. Oh, thank you very much. Thanks.